Amen. Psalm 118 says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. And it goes on to say, this is the day that the Lord has made. So we will rejoice and be glad in it. But there are times when it doesn't, we don't feel like rejoicing. Or there are times when we have burdens that are really hard to carry. And in Job, we see this. He says, in the midst of all the things, he says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And Paul continues to remind us in Romans, he said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us because of Jesus. He says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then he says, in all these things, in all the tribulations, in all of the, the persecution, in anything we face, we can be more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded. Are you persuaded this morning? He says, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love that is in, from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So then, since we have this high priest who intercedes for us, we can boldly approach the throne of grace this morning. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to lift up our voices, lift up high the name of Jesus, the one who's made a way for us to have a relationship with God this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. So let us be rejoiced and be glad in it. Be glad in him who has created this day. Let's lift our voices this morning. Sing, this is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. So we will, we will rejoice as we lift his name. Because this is the day that the Lord so come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Let's lift up our voices, set our eyes on Jesus, who is the same always. You sing. Whether the sun will shine and whether the skies will rain, I know that you are good and this is the day.
It's because you live, it's because you came, you died on a cross, that we can say, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. The only way we have access to God, the only way we can have freedom or hope is because of what you did on the cross. So we bless your name this morning, we give you honor and glory. How great the chasm that lay between
phrase, death has lost its grip on me. Man, if you know Jesus as your personal Savior, death does not have a grip on you. It may have a grip on you if you don't know him, but when you know Jesus Christ, it no longer has a grip on you. And uh, I am so thankful that Jesus Christ is our living hope. He's not just a God, he is the God. And we can have life and salvation in him.
because of what he did on the cross and that he is alive and at the right hand of the Father. God, we rejoice, we worship you, we praise you, we give you glory this morning. God, you are worthy of every bit of affection we have, and we don't have enough to give you, but humbly we say thank you that you are our living hope, not just a hope that is an idol or an object, but that you are alive. And you live to make intercession for us that we can live in and through your spirit. And so we worship you, God. We lean into you. We give you glory and praise and honor. And we ask all of this in the name that is above every name. The name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat and... Man, it's so good to see you out uh, today. Man, I am so thankful that you were here um, and worshiping with us. And and, uh, I want to start by asking a question. Have you ever truly felt hopeless? Has there been a time in your life that you felt hopeless. Several years ago, when I was on staff at Gardendale First Baptist, I had the privilege to go on a mission trip to North Africa, and, and it was such a one that we were going to a country that we were not able to really disclose the specific nation because of the security risk. And and so they asked us to go and ask us to do a sports camp, and we were able to go in, and, and actually the location that we were at, uh, we were not able to go in and have a crusade or preach, but we were able to have conversations with people. And, and so they gave us all of the different things and that we had to do, and even when I called back home, uh, there were certain things that we could not say over the phone because they were triggers uh, that they said you would be listening to. And, and so I can remember as I got closer and closer to the trip, I started having anxiety, and, and it was the trip that uh, many of you, several have asked why I, I, I never have grown a beard, and that's simply because I can't. It was on that trip that I decided I would never grow a beard. I was gone 16 days. I didn't shave all 16 days. I came back, and I saw my kids and my wife for the first time after 16 days, and my kids said, Dad... Did you not shave this morning before you left? And I was like, no, it's been 16 days that I haven't shaved. And they said, you look like a dog with mange. And so I decided that I would never try to grow a beard. But on that trip, when we got over there and we flew in, we had to walk across the border, and it was very uh, disturbing, to say the least, as we walked across the border with armed guards, and and we got in the taxi, and as we put our seatbelt on, the driver shook his head and said, no, 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 and I looked at the missionary, and I said, why are we not putting our seatbelt on? And he said, well, that's an insult because they feel like when you put a seatbelt on that you do not trust their driving skills. And I said, bingo, I don't trust anyone's driving skills. And and I can remember taking the seatbelt off and as we flew through the roads there in North Africa to get to the place that we were going. And we finally got there and and where we stayed was right across the road where there were military guys with arm, uh, with machine guns and different guns. And, and I can remember for the first day uh, or two, I was very kind of nervous. I was, had some anxiety to me because I'd never been in a place like this. And so we had a couple of guys that had gone with us and I had known them. We had played basketball together and we had coached together. And so I can remember about the fourth night in, We had uh, outside our door kept coming. We could see a shadow where it looked like someone was coming and listening into our conversation. My anxiety continued to grow as I was over there. And and so we uh, decided that, okay, well, let's just go to bed. And and we prayed, and God, you've got us here. You're in control. And I laid down. and, And as I laid down, I sit there, and it was quiet, and everybody got quiet. And up from under my bed, I heard, 
and a guy grabbed me. I was not real pastoral <laughs> at that moment because all hope was gone. I knew life was over, and in that second, I was just like, God, thank you for the years I had with my family for ministry. I will see you. Please take care of them. And then I hear everybody in the room laughing because one of the guys had crawled under the bed and decided that they were going to scare me as the leader of the trip. I was not happy at all. And although I did not say some things, words that I hadn't said in years bounced back into my mind as I looked at him and I looked at the guy and honestly, I was so angry. I said, I'm going to go in the other room right now. And he said, man, we were just joking. I said, the best thing you can do is go to bed. Because in Jesus' name, I want to choke you out. <laughs> I felt totally hopeless in that moment. But have you ever felt hopeless? Have you ever been to the place that maybe you didn't feel like I did, but you felt hopeless in a different capacity? Or maybe you felt hopeless in a greater capacity than even I did? Well, if you have, I want you to lean in to the message, not only today, but we're going to start a series uh, on the book of 1 Peter. I invite you to turn the, to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. We're going to look at just two verses as we look at an introduction this morning. But maybe you're here and you say, I have felt hopeless like that. Maybe you're here and say, I've never felt hopeless. Well, I want to say, by the way, if you haven't, you will. And here, as we look at 1 Peter... Uh, we're going to journey through this book, and we're going to uh, look at this book that even though it was written over 1,900 years ago, it mirrors our cu current climate in 2024. Uh, as we begin, I want you to imagine that you're in a house with Peter in Rome, and of course, Sylvanius is one that is a dear brother to him, and is helping him write. We know that he's in Rome. It says in chapter 5, it calls it Babylon, but it's Rome that he is writing from, and he's writing this letter because uh, they are at a place that brothers and sisters are scattered all over Asia Minor, and, and many of them have lost hope. Many of them uh, have felt despair and need encouragement because they have suffered a lot of persecution. They have experienced harassment. They have experienced a lot of things as Christians that you would hope that you wouldn't feel, but Scripture tells us that you will face when you name the name of Christ. And so because Peter's life was such a testimony of someone who struggled as a Christian and was used by God, here Peter writes and he says, I want to share a message of hope in an hour that you may experience trials. And so as we look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, I want us to look simply at three things this morning as we begin in this book. And we're going to stay in this. We're going to look at 14 messages throughout the book of 1 Peter, uh, leading all the way up to Labor Day weekend in the fall. But I really, as I begin to pray and prep for the summer uh, a while back, my heart came to First Peter because it's so accurate toward the climate of our day. I've never seen a day in our country that you are persecuted, you are ridiculed for being a biblical follower of Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, it's not going to get any better. And I know sometimes as Christians, it's easy to say, well, I'm just going to get in a holy huddle and I'm just going to stay here and, and what do I do and, and, and what's going to happen. But as Peter writes the believers that are scattered out, I want you to lean in and listen to what not only he's telling them, but how it applies to us, how it applies to me, how it applies 
to you today. So in verse 1 of 1 Peter 1, we pick up by reading, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. I want you to see three things just briefly in these first two verses. First of all, I want you to see his credentials, Peter's credentials. First of all, uh, we know that he was a fisherman turned follower of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, we, we read this. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Jesus Two, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said, Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Uh, Simon Peter, uh, who he was originally called Simon, Jesus changed his name, as we'll see in a moment, to Peter. He was a fisherman. That's why I think I like Peter so well. It's because he was a fisherman. He went out and he knew that trade. They enjoyed it. It's what they did for a living. Uh, many of you know I share that I love to fish. I, I enjoy going out. Maybe it's for the solitude as uh, Melanie said when I, I kind of first picked that back up several years ago, uh, she, when I went out with one of my buddies, she said, so what do y'all talk about? I don't know. We just, sometimes we talk for a couple of hours and sometimes we don't say a word. And oftentimes she's asked me when I've gone fishing with a certain person, well, well how's their wife? I, I, I don't know. I didn't talk about that. Well, well, what did you talk about? Well, we talked about lures and baits, and we talked about all kinds of stuff. We might talk about uh, the rapture and revelation, and we might talk about a ball team. We might talk about the good old days, or we might not talk for, all, for the whole time. It's just, it's something about that when you go, but when you catch a fish, there's nothing like it. Now, I know by the excitement that I see on your face, some of you could care less. But you've never caught a seven-pound bass. Have any of you, let's, let's just figure this out. Who has not ever caught a bass, raise your hand. If you've never caught a bass, raise your hand. Okay, it's impossible for y'all to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but when you're there and you catch a fish and you get in the boat, there's nothing like it. I, my wife, uh, Melanie, loves to fish and we'll go. And man, one time I'll sit there and I was like, ah! She said, you got one? I said, no, it's a log. She said, well, why did you pull so hard? I said, because you never know. It might just be a fish, and I want to be ready. I mean, I'm already, always ready, and, and, and I love fishing and doing that. But here we see that Peter, who was a fisherman, and he was good at it, he turned to a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, hey, I want you to follow me. And immediately he dropped everything he was doing, and he followed Jesus Christ. Man, when I get to heaven, that's a conversation I want to have. That he was so struck when he encountered Jesus Christ that he left everything he was doing to follow him. But not only he was a fisher turned follower, he was one of the 12 disciples. In Matthew 10, we see that it says in verse 1, he called to him 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The name of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, 
Simon the Zealot and Judas, Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. So he was also one of the inner circle with Jesus. He was one that he walked and he talked and he was those original disciples. But he also, I want you to see, he was someone that everything in his life changed because of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 16, verses 13 through 19, we pick up in a story and it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus changed everything about Simon Peter. He even changed his name. The word Peter literally comes from the Greek word petros, which we get the word rock. And when Simon Peter began to follow Jesus and he came to the place that he said, you are the Messiah, and he confessed him as the Savior, Jesus said, look, I'm going to use you in a way that you don't even understand. And I think sometimes as you see Simon Peter's life later in the book of John when he denied Jesus Christ, you see that sadness because he knew that he had been changed by Jesus Christ. But as Simon Peter writes this, he has some incredible credentials. He, he was also a key leader in the early church in Jerusalem that he led there. And then later on in his ministry, we know, and even here we see in 1 Peter, that he carried the gospel beyond the borders of Israel. Not just to the Jews, the chosen people of Israel, but to the Gentiles who we ultimately, if you are here and you are not of Jewish descent, you are a Gentile. We have the gospel because ultimately it was carried beyond the borders of Israel. And so this book is written later in his journey and he comes to the place that as he is in Rome and he's with Sylvanus and, and they are there in their home and they have begun to talk about the people that are discouraged, the people that are scattered, the people that feel like there's no hope. He comes and he begins to talk with him and as Sylvanus probably pins the words, Peter is sitting here and begins to speak and encourage, and he's not just saying it to say it, he's saying it out of experience. But I want you to see a second thing as we begin looking at this book, not just his credentials, but his audience. Peter's writing to the exiled believers, those believers that have been dispersed out, primarily non-Jewish believers. There it says in verse 1, Peter, apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. Now, this letter that Peter is writing was a circular letter to the churches, to the communities in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. I think I have a couple of maps. This kind of is a broader map that you see Rome in the top left. You see where Jerusalem is in the bottom right where he was a key leader. Now, up in the top right where you see Galatia, that is modern-day Turkey. And so that is where he is writing. Even though he's over in Rome, he is writing and sending this letter to them in these churches. And this is a smaller kind of a picture of Galatia, Bithynia, and Pontius up top, uh, Cappadocia to the right. And, of course, you see all of those areas that are familiar in the New Testament. But this is the area that he is writing to. And as they would get a letter, they would read that and they would pass it along to the next area in the next community. 
And so as we are here, we talked about how they experienced persecution, harassment, hostility toward uh, Christians. And it comes there, and in that verse, it says, uh, it says there in the beginning, to those who are elect exiles. That's who he's writing to, these people who had been dispersed. And so many times we see scripture and we see a few words and, and people have tried to argue or fight over the meaning of these words. Some of these words we'll see in 1 Peter like the word elect or the word for knowledge. And here we come to this word that says it's written to the elect exiles. A lot of doctrine, a lot of theology has been based on election or foreknowledge. Uh, and, and some of that, if you go and study, we're not going to get super deep into this. But there are those that when you talk about this word elect, that Jesus, God foreknew who would know uh, Jesus Christ as personal Savior. And uh, there is no response. And then you have another side that people uh, would come to the place that say there is a response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and this word elect, literally in the Greek, it means chosen or selected. And here it describes people who choose to follow the Lord. Uh, they become God's choice by freely receiving faith. And sometimes when you hear these words, and we'll see the word foreknowledge in just a moment, there are those that would say, hey, if you're going to be saved, you're going to be saved. There's nothing you can do about it. They would call that election. Uh, there was a, uh, a group that was known, kind of it started by a guy named John Calvin that had a group of followers that even that you see in more reformed churches today that would believe in election, that, hey, there is nothing that you can do uh, that to be saved, those who are elected or foreordained will get saved. Those who are not will not. And so when you come to these, I think sometimes people get nervous about these words. Well, does God know everything? Yes. Does he know who will, if he knows everything, will he know who accepts or rejects him? Does Scripture tell us that there is a responsibility for us to respond to the gospel? Yes. How does it all work out? Well, guess what? When we get to heaven, we'll understand fully. But we see these terms, elect, we see the terms for knowledge. But here, it is the idea when you see that, it's the idea of people who have not only been chosen, but chose to follow the Lord. I'm going to try to break it down. This might be a very, very weak, meager way to explain it. But hopefully, hopefully this will help you. Election is kind of like if Michael Jordan was here picking a basketball team. And he's decided to select me to be on his team. You would say, why would he select you? It's okay. You would say, why would he select you? I was something back in my prime, but I no longer am. Why would he select a 55 I'm not 56 yet, I'm still 55. Why would he select a 55-year-old, total knee replacement, bad shoulder, got neck problems to be on his team? I have no idea. But let's say he chose me to be on his team. That's fine and great and good, but I must accept the invitation. 
I will not be on his team unless I, he can say, hey, I want you to be on my team and I can be here in shock. But to be on his team, I would accept that. Do I have anything to do with that? Do I have anything with him to offer that or extend that to me? No, it might be just because he's a gracious person. I cannot be on his team because of my talents, my abilities. I have nothing to bring to that other than he chose to invite me. But if I accept, I become a part of a great winning team because I believe he's the greatest basketball player of all time. Same way with my relationship with Christ. There is nothing I can do to save myself. There's nothing that I bring to God other than Scripture says all we bring is what? Filthy rags. But in God's goodness and God's graciousness, he extends salvation freely and he makes a call to me. Scripture says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's an invitation not based on our works, not based on our goodness, but based on his greatness. But when I say yes to Jesus, I am on the winning side. I love that old Song. I don't know if you, it, it was called I'm on the Winning Side. And I can remember hearing one guy sing that years and years ago in the late 80s, the early 90s. Yes, I was alive then, students. And I can remember I'm on the winning side. I'm on the winning side. Man, and that stuck with me. Because of Jesus, he invited me. I had nothing to offer I had nothing to bring, but because of him, I have a relationship with him. And that's the picture that we have here with this word, elect exile. And so I want to take just a second to say a couple of things. Never run from things in Scripture you may not fully understand. Lean into God's word and his spirit for understanding and wisdom. Never try to fully understand an infinite God with a finite mind and always seek the mind of Christ. I think sometimes when we run to passages that have people or things or situations that have tension in Scripture, we tend not to talk about it, but you don't have to always have the answer. Sometimes the greatest answer is, hey, I'm not sure, but I will go and study that. But as we look here at the overall picture, these who have Jesus has called to himself and they have responded by following him, they came to the place that they felt like they were exiled, that they were on the outskirts, that they had things that happened to them in their life that troubled them and they felt like there was no hope. I'm often reminded of what Paul said in Philippians 3. Verses 20 and 21 where he says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Guys, I want to encourage you. I'm I'm so thankful to be a citizen of the United States of America. I'm excited that I live in a free country. But my citizenship and my hope is not in our government. It's not in documents. My hope and faith and citizenship is in a foreign country named heaven. And as long as I keep my eyes here and as long as I put value in my citizenship here and we know that we are to respond to authority, Romans 13 says that. Paul says, look, we are to be subject to the higher powers. But he calls us to remember that ultimately we are headed for another place. So this is who he's writing to. This is his audience that he's encouraging them But I want to close 
with the last thing, I want you to see his purpose in writing 1 Peter. It's to encourage believers that God is in control. 1 Peter is writing the believers, the exiled elect, to say God is in control. And let me tell you this morning, let me speak to you. God is in control. That's to the right side of the congregation. To the left side of the congregation, God is in control. Let me tell you, there's times that we wonder that. There's times that we question this. There's times that things happen in our lives that come our way that we sit back and even if we don't say them verbally, we sit back and sometimes maybe we cross our arms and we don't want to, but we say, God, I can't see why you're letting this happen and what's going on. But he is writing, Peter is writing these people to say, look, don't lose hope. Our God is in control. He says there in verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. He is encouraging Christians here who are suffering to remind them that Jesus is enough. And he will sustain them even when they face undeserved trials, problems, and persecution. Because Jesus paid the greatest price to redeem your soul. Nothing has or will ever take God by surprise. And because he's in control, you can walk in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Christ. That's a phrase that we read here in verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. In other words, God knew before the foundations of the world that even though he created man, man would sin, but he would have a plan to take away that sin And not only he would provide his son, Jesus Christ, to live, to die, to be raised from the dead, that we could be made right with God. He also knew that he would send the Spirit so that we could live sanctified lives. That doesn't mean perfect lives, but we can live in obedience to Jesus through the supernatural power of his Spirit. In other words... What Peter is going to be talking about through this book is he's going to be challenging these believers that you don't have to live in darkness. You may be in darkness, you may be in discouragement, you may be in doubt for a period of time, but you don't have to stay there because Scripture says when Jesus went to the Father, he left the Comforter, the Spirit who is inside of us. You have the Spirit of God inside of you if you know Jesus as your Savior. I'm going to say it again. You have the Spirit of God inside of you if you know Jesus as your Savior. And so First Peter, while he writes, he's saying, live like you have the Spirit inside of you. So many times we name the name of Christ and we don't live as though the Spirit is inside of us. We look sad. We look mopey. Man, the election's coming up. I wonder what's going to happen. I I mean, I I don't know about this. And and I see riots here and I see people saying this here. and, And over in Israel you have all this. Look, I don't worry Am I concerned? Yes. Do I sit back and kind of get uneasy at times? Absolutely. But you know what? It's the greatest time in the world to shine the light of Jesus Christ because the world is dark, they're without hope, and we have the hope of Jesus Christ. Believers can walk in sanctification. I don't have to live like I did before. I met Jesus. I can walk in obedience, not because I have anything to bring, but because he's changed me. But also because God is in control, I can experience forgiveness because of Jesus Christ. I love that Simon Peter wrote this. He says there in verse 2, there's a phrase, and for the sprinkling with his blood. 
That's a reference back to the Old Testament. If you go back into the Old Testament, you'll see three places that we kind of see people and the sprinkling of blood covering them. But in Exodus 24, and I'm not going to look at it this morning, but Moses initiates with the Israelites a covenant. And they are sprinkled with the blood to cover that. And in like manner, just as that covenant was made with them, we have a covenant with God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. When you go throughout Scripture, that's why I love Scripture. It's this beautiful narrative from Genesis to Revelation. And, and you see how in the Old Testament they had to do temporary sacrifices. And there had to be the shedding of blood for the temporary covering of sin. But it points to one that would come. And we, knew, we know that today as Jesus Christ that he shed his blood. And when he shed his blood... The temple veil was ripped from top to bottom, meaning you don't need me. I don't need you. I can go straight to God because my mediator is no longer man, but it's Jesus Christ. And when he shed his blood, I have been covered. And it's especially great because as we read the words of Simon Peter here, he is talking about being covered by the blood of Jesus And yes, we are to live in obedience to Christ. Yes, we are to live sanctified. Yes, we are to live with joy in our heart. Yes, we are to live with purpose, living as though God's in control. But sometimes we don't. Amen? At least, let me rephrase it. Sometimes your pastor don't. Sometimes I can remember hearing great sermons and, man, a preacher preaching and sweating like I'm sweating And like just getting after it. And I'm sitting there and go, man, that's great. I ought to be like that. But boy, I fell. Man, I dropped the ball so often. That's what I love about 1 Peter as we're going to journey. Because he's one that denied Jesus. He's one that's right there in the trenches and throughout his life. You see him proclaiming. You see him doing some great things. But you also see him as a total failure as some would look like when they are put next to Christ. But he comes and he writes and he says, I want you to know that you can live for Christ. You can live sanctified lives. You can live obedience. Not that you can do it, but the Spirit of God inside of you can do that, but you're still going to fail. But when you fail, just remember that you are covered. You know, what would it be like in church if we really viewed people the way we should view people, right? Because we come in church, and it's easy for me to see Dwayne. Hey, man, how are you doing today? What's your normal answer? I'm doing great. You're doing great, right? Now, I know he had surgery, right, not too long ago. And I know he's not done real great at times because I haven't done real great. And sometimes we pass people in church and we look at them and we're carrying a load or we're doing things and, and we look at someone and maybe they don't shake my hand or maybe they don't respond the way that I think they should. And we don't see them as sinners that have been saved and changed by grace. You know why I come here? I don't come here because I have it all together. I come here because he has it all together, and I need you. I need Jesus, but you have the God's spirit inside of you. I need to be encouraged by you. I need to encourage you. We ought to be going through the halls, high-fiving, talking, hugging. I know some of you, that wears you out. COVID was the best time of life for y'all because nobody shook your hand. Nobody, you know, patted you on the back. You got to live in your bubble. But you know what? And and I have to watch that because sometimes I'm a hugger and I'll go up and I'll go to hug somebody and they'll do this. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I missed that one. But we were created to walk and do life together. And and that's what Simon Peter's saying. I want to encourage you because you're going to be discouraged. You're going to be down. But I want you to experience grace and peace multiplied. You realize you can experience that even in sorrow, even in persecution. Why? Because grace and peace do not depend 
on my happiness, but they depend on my position in Christ. And when I realize my position in Christ, it changes everything and I can have grace to others. I can extend peace and receive peace because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. And so I ask the search team to come up. I know it's Memorial Day. I know you're like, Pastor, I thought you would be a lot quicker today. But I want us to close by responding in song. But the resurrection changed everything in Peter's life. At the crucifixion, he's nowhere to be found. But because of the resurrection of Jesus, he experienced hope. And I want to close today by saying, is our world in a mess? Yes. Man, are you going to encounter some really bad stuff and sufferings? Yes. Are you going to have to make decisions that you don't know where to go and what to do? Possibly. But just as Peter wrote almost 2,000 years ago and encouraged them, I want to encourage you. Because he wasn't just a fisherman that turned into a follower of Jesus. He was dead and brought to life and purpose. And he was a walking example of someone who didn't have it all together, but he finally caught on that he didn't have to because Jesus did. And so as we walk over the next few weeks through this, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to jump in, study, walk with us. If you have questions, write them down. Send them to me, text me, email me. Let's just walk through 1 Peter. And as the world we look at around us seems to be falling apart, let's let the Holy Spirit lift our eyes to our home. Which moth and rust will never corrupt. There'll be no sad goodbyes. There'll be no knee surgeries or hip surgeries. And we will just spend eternity not plucking on harps, singing kumbaya, but we'll be enjoying life like we never have before. And so while I'm here, I want to live getting ready for there. Because in my mind, in my heart, I'm already there. Would you stand to your feet? And I want to pray for us. And we're just going to simply respond in song. If you need someone to pray with you, I'll be here. We'll have staff here. If you're a lady and need prayer, we have ladies that will pray with you. Maybe you just need to come and kneel and say, God, I'll be honest, life feels like it's dealt me a bad blow and this world's really not been that encouraging. But God, renew my mind and my heart. I want to live for you, not because I have anything to bring, but because of your goodness. You invited me to have a relationship and I responded with yes. Yes. So, Father, I pray that you would help me to look more like you, to live more like you. And when I fail, thank you that your blood has already covered me. And I pray that you would help us as we journey, not just through the book of 1 Peter, not just through persecutions, but we are on a journey keeping our eyes on our city and our home where we will spend eternity with you. Thank you for loving us. God, anyone that doesn't know you, God, draw them to you that they may come and say yes to the message of hope of Jesus Christ. We respond in your name we pray. Amen.
wonderful Savior. He is worthy of our worship. I pray that you'll journey with us. I hope you have a great Memorial Day weekend. Don't eat too many burgers and hot dogs. Give somebody a high five or hug them. And if you don't want to be hugged, just look at the ground and quickly exit right. We love y'all. Have a great week. We'll see you Wednesday night at our group.